My name is Daniel Bolt. I'm from Mainburg in Germany. So sorry for my English in the first place. Um, Mainberg is a company that is now uh, 40 years old and uh, doing nothing else but synchronization. So we're doing also PTP since nearly 15 years now. So um, we did it for other industries like the telecoms, finance, and so on. And now since more than three years now also for the broadcasters. So the first question that everybody might ask is, why do we need PTP timing for 2110? And uh, you have audio transmitters and video transmitters on one side, and you have the receivers on uh, the other side, and all communicate via a network. So uh, the goal is that all those nodes, the transmitters and the receivers, are synchronized by a common time base called the PTP Grandmaster that is locked to a UTC reference like GPS. If all those receivers are synchronized, then those transmitters can send those packets into the network. And as we learned, a network is asynchronous, and the latency and the packet delivery is not guaranteed. So the packets arrive at the receivers in an arbitrary order. But now there is the RTP timestamp evaluated that represents the sampling time of each packet, and this RTP timestamp is derived from the PTP synchronized nodes at the transmitters and the receivers. And then the receivers are in the position to realign those packets to uh, regenerate uh, a, a, program a program stream that is uh, uh, lip sync and um, totally uh, complete to, um, to distribute to the, uh, to the end user. So what is PTP, actually? PTP is an IEEE standard. And this standard is called IEEE 1588. And PTP is the protocol, the precision time protocol that is described in the standard. And it's uh, sponsored by the IEEE Instrumentation and Measurement Society. The current version that is currently used is 1588-2008, uh, or called PTP version 2. The previous version was PTP version 1, released in 2002. Sim uh, still used by some systems, for example, Dante Audio. Um, the problem is that PTP version 1 is totally incompatible with version 2. So a version 2 master cannot synchronize a version 1 slave and vice versa. But the upcoming version, PTP version 2.1, will be fully backwards compatible to version 2 and will come up uh, this year. PTP is a technology that is already widely used in Ethernet-based applications in other industries like telecom, power, finance, tester measurement, industrial automation, and so on in several uh, versions and uh, profiles. PTP itself is a highly generic standard in the first place, but can be um, customized by profiles. It allows for a simple hierarchical time transfer where only one PTP grandmaster source is selected, unlike the NTP protocol where you have simultaneously acting servers and the slave decides which master to use. It's different with PTP. There is the masters that decide among themselves which master should be used. Um, it allows a two-way time transfer to all slaves, so getting the full uh, time of day information then the clock deviation can be calculated and corrected. It allows for sub-microsecond accuracy down to a level like um, 50 or 100 of nanoseconds. And the master is selected autonomously within the protocol by using the so-called best master clock algorithm. So the only challenge, and that's not covered by the standard is say, uh, itself, uh, that you have variation in packet transmission delays and you have to deal with that. We come to this point uh, uh, later. So what makes PTP so precise in the first place? So the answer is hardware timestamping. How does that work? If we have um, um, uh, a PC system, a server, or any kind of IP-capable uh, node, 
You have the higher network layers where all the software stuff is running and the PTP stack in the master here uh, um, uh, displayed here on top. And then you have the kernel space and the network interface card that consists of two components, the Mac layer and the file layer. And um, between those two components, there is a so-called media independent interface that listens to the packets and detects the moment a PTP packet is going on the wire. And at that particular moment, a timestamp is taken by a highly accurate clock, and this information is, tr is transported to the higher network layers uh, to make use of it. This technology will ensure that the uh, variation in delays from the user space to the kernel space is completely el eliminated. You have the same system on the slave side, but just the direction is the other way around. But then you have a network in between. And to maintain the full level of accuracy between the master and the slave, your switch uh, must have the same type of mechanism so um, that a hardware time sink is, ta is taken on the ing ingress point ingress port and a uh, hardware time step is taken at the egress port and compensate uh, for the queuing delay in between. When the, this chain is fully maintained from master to slave, then you are able to maintain a level of accuracy that is around 50 to 100 nanoseconds easily. So how is the message, message exchange going between master and slaves? First, the master sends out a sync message to all the slaves in the network. This is mostly done via a multicast message. And uh, the slave afterwards sends a message back to the master <coughs> to measure the delay, and the master then responds to it. On the slave side, you have then four timestamps in total collected. And based on these formulas, you can calculate your clock offset and your delay to your grandmaster and, and correct your clock for it. So what does these four timestamps actually mean? They mean when the master sends out a sync packet, it says, now it's roughly that time, just roughly. When the packet leaves uh, the system, it is followed by a second packet that actually says, when I said it was that time, it was actually precisely this time. So the moment the sync message was leaving, it was captured with a high accuracy, and this is just an informational follow-up packet to transport this information. So the timestamp one is now transported to the slave, and at the moment the sync message arrives at the slave, the timestamp two is then taken. Then the slave issues a message, basically saying, tell me when you receive this and I will store the time when this message leaves my unit as a T3 timestamp. And then the response from the master is, okay, I got your last message at that uh, precise time and send this information back to you. Then we have again the offset and the delay. So this is the theory why you can achieve such a high accuracy with PTP. And what you need to know is when you plan your infrastructure that you take care about the fact that you do not over-provision your network. This is uh, the basic because if you, if you do, then you have also other problems besides uh, timing. Uh, you need to know your limits and hardware architecture of your network devices. Um, and uh, some of these problems can be mitigated by just prioritizing PTP traffic, but this is, the, uh, this is not solving uh, the, the queuing issues. So a better way, of course, careful planning your network architecture and load and um, keep aware uh, of the fact that uh, your network is not fully loaded. But the best option is, of course, to use PTP-aware network devices, the switches that operate either in transparent clock or boundary clock mode. So I will come to the now to the functionality about the differences between those two uh, concepts. So how is a boundary clock scheme schematic like? 
um, the basic principle is that every PTP packet that arrives here is completely terminated at that unit. So it's not passing through, it's terminated at one port. And a PTP controller is controlling the, re the internal clock. So a boundary clock is a real clock. There's a real clock inside that is adjusted. That is something you uh, should know. And on all other ports, which then are now in master state, the PTP packets are regenerated by the system. They are regenerated by the, uh, by, by the switch. And in the network, it works that way that a grandmaster on top is synchronizing one port at a, at a boundary clock switch. And all other ports are in master state, serving PTP to all the end nodes. So what happens now if this link breaks up? Then all other ports go to a so, in a so-called listening state and wait if any other um, device is capable to be the new master. And um, then everybody is announcing then their own quality parameters. And afterwards, a new master is chosen and all slaves follow. So here we have also the basic redundancy concept that you can achieve with a PTP network. Just add another grandmaster to uh, to, the, to the boundary clock, and they will find out who currently is the best master for your system. And of course, this can be cascaded as well. In contrast to this concept, the transparent clock works a little bit different. It says it's a transparent clock because the PTP packets are uh, passed through transparently. So the same packet that arrives at the switch is leaving the switch afterwards. And the clock is not really adjusted. The, the clock is a free running counter that should be frequency aligned. This, is, this um, um, differentiates a good transparent clock from a bad transparent clock when the internal clock is at least frequency aligned to the PTP packets. And uh, the time that the, that the packet took from master to slave point is just measured relatively. And this is put in as a correction factor into the packet itself. So how does this work? A master sends out a sync message into the switch. And at the moment the packet arrives, a timestamp is taken and saved in memory. If the packet goes out on to port number two. At the moment uh, the packet is passing, a second timestamp is taken, saved in memory, and just subtracted from the first one. And this difference, this relative time, is just added to the so-called correction field that might have already a value inside from the transparent clock in advance that, that came before. So this value is accumulated in the transparent clock switch and sent out again to the slave. So this is the residence time that is compensated here with the transparent clock. So to summarize that up, a boundary clock is an active PTP device with a real clock inside. Every port acts as a PTP node called an ordinary clock. And the time is regenerated and forwarded to all the slaves. In contrast to that, the transparent clock is a passive PTP device, and uh, the residence time is measured for every packet. Timestamps are drawn at ingress and egress, and the difference is added to the correction field. So the pros and cons for boundary clocks and transparent clocks. Boundary clocks are good for hierarchical systems, they scale well with a number of devices because the advantage is that you only communicate between the links. There's only a master-slave relationship between a link on the boundary clock and the end node. And um, it can also translate between different media. So you can uh, uh, run a different type of PTP configuration on another uh, grandmaster port compared to another one. However, as this is a there's a real clock inside a boundary clock. The drawback is that it requires uh, continuous monitoring. 
And highly cascaded systems require special attention because if you have several clocks in a chain, this whole system tends to swing. But um, in a classical broadcast spine leaf architecture, you ha do not have more than two or three hops, and uh, this, is, this is not really an issue here. So transparent clocks have the advantage there's simple deployment, minimal monitoring, no real clock that, can, um, uh, that is added in the, in the chain, and the accuracy is independent of network topology. Some people tend to say that there is a difference between transparent clocks and boundary clocks in terms of accuracy. But from the standards point of view, from the concept uh, of those two types of clocks, there is no difference in the achievable accuracy. It could be that a special implementation of switch A compared to another implementation to vendor B is worse or, be uh, or better. But from the concept of those two um, um, uh, PTP-aware switches, the accuracy can be equal. So with transparent clocks, you have the disadvantage that it scales poorly with a number of devices because all the packets also from the slaves are distributed in the whole network. So everybody sees everything. Also the packets that is not for them. So you must take care about the fact that the master is strong enough uh, to, to deal with all those requests from all these uh, slaves in your network. But then you would solve this problem. <clears throat> so what are profiles? The, pro the problem is PTP has so many configuration options and uh, configuring them wrong or differently between master and slaves mean <coughs> sorry, that um, interoperability is not guaranteed and some of these options simply do not work together. So to simplify things, um, the solution is to uh, create profiles. Those profiles are usually defined outside uh, of the 1588 committee. Um, like and uh, other standardization organizations. So the ITU defined profiles for the telecom industry, the SEMT defined a profile for the broadcasters, the AAS did this already a couple of years before, the SEMT for, for the audio people, and the IEEE also defined a profile for the power and substation uh, industry. So they define additional rules for, for specific class, classes of applications. So let's come to the SEMTI profile. The profile the SEMTI created is called ST2059-2. The application, as, we might, uh, uh, as you know, is time, phase, and frequency transfer in an all-IP uh, broadcast environment. It uh, should be some kind of genlog over IP to replace Blackburst, DARS, or word clock. So the definition is that you use uh, either multicast, unicast, or mixed mode operation. Mixed mode means that the sync messages from the master is sent in multicast, and the delay requests from the slaves are sent in unicast to reduce the traffic, the overall traffic in the network. The network mapping should be uh, IP and UDP, UDP packets. Um, the standard does not force you to use um, PTP-aware network devices, but on-pass support, as they, as they call it, is not man mandatory, but recommended. If the network load on those switches uh, um, raise, then uh, the accuracy will degrade if those uh, switches are not PTP-aware. And a special thing with the SEMTI profile is that it sends out one message per second with additional information, so-called the synchronization metadata. So everything that is really missing in the PTP standard that is important for a broadcast environment is packed into this management um, message. For example, the frame rate, do I use 25 hertz, 50 hertz, 24, uh, 7, 9, and so on? Do I use drop or color frame indication, daily jam events, leap seconds, local time information, so what is my uh, real time, not the UTC time here at my location, and some more information about the quality of the master. So everything that is missing and interesting for a broadcast environment is put into this message. And the slaves should be able to uh, receive that information 
to do some kind of auto configuration of the whole system. So if a, ca if a camera is plugged into the system and sees, okay, I have uh, 25 hertz or 50 hertz, then I can just switch on that option automatically without uh, um, configuring that. The profile also states that a slave should be able to lock to a grandmaster within five seconds and reach a level of one microsecond of accuracy compared to other devices or plus minus 500 nanoseconds accuracy to the master. It's not a mandatory requirement, but um, the, um, the settings, the default settings of the SMT profile are designed in a way where a slave can be in the position to do so. In practice, only a few devices that are already on the market are able to lock within five seconds. Mostly it's at least 10, 15 seconds, but it's still quick enough for also for, um, for an outside broadcast operation, for example. And the standard should ensure the backward compatibility to existing systems. So you should be able to regenerate a black burst from a PTP signal and also generate time labels from that. Other standards in this field are the AS67 media profile. So the AS guys have uh, already created a profile before the SMT guys did. And um, it's based on the default uh, profile and it has some lower message rates compared to, um, to the video profile. But there has been a document created by the AS called ASR16-2016 which defines PTP parameters for AAS 67 and 2059 2 interoperability. So there are some common rates and common parameters defined so that audio devices and video devices can use the same profile in the same network from the same grandmaster because it simply does not make any sense to drive two different PTP profiles in parallel to synchronize audio and video. So there is the 2059-1 standard, which describes time labels and alignment points for video sync signals in reference to uh, the PTP time. So how does this work? Every node has the same absolute time information. So day, year, hours, minutes, and seconds, and so on. And uh, uh, beginning of the whole Epoch is defined, so everything starts at the 1st of January 1970 at midnight. So from this reference point, you can calculate everything else from it. For example, uh, an NTSC signal or a PAL uh, signal with a, with a, um, um, with a color uh, burst sequence that it's in the right order. Uh, everything is defined in the standard, how to recreate that from from every point of starting point uh, that, that you can imagine. So everything is referenced back to this date and uh, you can create every other type of signal from it. So PTP is just time, nothing else. No special frequency, nothing else that SMT uh, um, uh, di did before, but you are able to generate everything else from it. So as I said, 2059-1 defines alignment points to regenerate a black burst signal, but SEMTI uses uneven media frequencies. So how can this be combined together? PTP is just time and nothing else like a running time counter, and the standard defines events. For example, the beginning of the first line of the video picture, or the, the moment when the vertical blanking interval uh, appears. So these events have special points in time in the future, and uh, a signal is generated at this specific event. And this is combined with the frequency that is needed for this specific signal, because PTP is usually derived from a, free, from a, from a 10 megahertz oscillator, and this must be brought by, uh, into uh, those um, uneven SEMTI frequencies. And this signal generator uh, combines those two um, uh, signals and outputs a black burst, a tri-level, or something else. 
So with, this pro with these profiles, a hybrid scenario is possible. So you have, you can have PTP grandmasters and synchronized PTP slaves in an all IP environment, but you can also use legacy equipment and derive Blackburst, DARS, or timecode from a PTP slave. So in this scenario, you can uh, migrate slowly uh, if you have not the luxury to put everything uh, on the green field. So the PTP profile finds itself in the 702110-10 part of the standard. In dash 10, the system timing is defined, and this part of the standard includes PTP and how it should be used in 2110. So transmitters and receivers synchronize their clocks to PTP. The transmitters label every packet with an RTP timestamp that represents the time when it was sampled and the receivers can now rearrange those streams correctly and evaluate them um, and bring, bring the packets into the right order. 2110-10 also includes uh, the so-called uh, session description protocol, which contains information about every stream that's, uh, uh, that's in the network. Um, we were always talking about uh, studio production here but you can also use PTP in remote production. Um, so the specific task that, that um, we did for um, a public broadcaster in Germany was that remote studios should be IP connected over a wide area connection, and, but they should be synchronized, not locally, but remotely from a central master system. So the challenge was that provide, providing PTP over this one connection um, uh, which had unpredictable uh, packet delay variation, or jitter, if you want to call it this way, packet jitter, that directly affects slave accuracy and stability. Because it's a leased line, you no, don't know which type of equipment is between, um, between there, and it's not fully PTP aware on that path. So the solution is using a kind of gateway clock at the remote side, that is filtering the PTP signal from the master over the one connection and provides then a clean PTP master signal to the local PTP clients, with that, but without the need of an additional GPS antenna on the roof on that, of that remote site. So how was that done? We had placed a synchronization master in Cologne and uh, uh, was serving all those uh, signals uh, locally uh, that was needed there and then was using a PTP master, uh, providing time of day and phase, and a two megahertz um, signal to this media router equipment used here, over the wide area connection to the gateway clock in Düsseldorf. So we had a PTP input that was impacted by a pretty high jitter, but we had also a two megahertz output signal from that media router and combined this in the, as a kind of a hybrid clock in that uh, equipment here, and uh, provided, uh, in this case, the AS67 media profile, because it was a radio studio, uh, and a word clock and a DARS signal uh, to, the, um, uh, to the local systems there, without the need of an additional GPS antenna on that roof. That is um, another practic practical example besides the, um, besides the studio projects that we discussed uh, in the last um, presentation. At the end of the presentation, I would like to give you a short um, overview about the upcoming revision. So in this year, the PTP version 2.1 standard is coming out. And um, it should be backward compatible to version 2. So it should not break the 2008 edition. New features are always optional. If the system does not support it, just don't use it, but you can synchronize to that master. And old features work uh, as before. And the new features uh, are uh, listed here. So there is a lot of uh, work done cu uh, currently with security that you can have uh, separate domains working together, so you have a multi-master constellation, so 
multiple active masters like in NTP could be possible then to compare the times of these two masters. Uh, it adds um, a chapter for slave monitoring and adds some additional features for um, uh, flexibility here. So, conclusions. Carefully plan your network architecture. A PTP uh, aware network is not mandatory, but using boundary or time span clocks or both uh, is of course better and today uh, the standard, I would say. Um, have an eye on your PTP load a master can handle and the uh, limitations of your PTP devices. Um, to know what's going on, please monitor your PTP nodes. There are several ways to do it. Uh, we can discuss this um, um, outside of this, um, this event, of course. Um, and please note that timing is critical in such an environment. Think about redundancy. Uh, Gerard will tell you something about 2022-7, uh, for example, using multiple masters in the network, and also uh, be aware that jamming and spoofing of GPS signals might be, uh, might be an issue, depending where you are. And um, in general, you can say also SDI and IP can coexist to allow for a smooth transition. So thank you very much for your attention. Open for questions. Okay, I do have any questions. This one here. Hi there. I've actually got a couple of questions. The first is um, obviously if we can work with um, non PTP aware networks, uh, it gives us a lot more choices. Uh, so what kind of accuracies do the broadcast industry actually require? Um, in the 2059-2 profile, um, an, accur an accuracy of one microsecond is required. Um, it can be achieved when using non-PTP aware switches, but then you have to take care about other things. Then it's not guaranteed. It's a subject to test. Um, that you do not uh, heavily load your switches, you, pr you should prioritize the PTP traffic, and you might increase also the PTP packet rate so that a slave can be in a position to filter out the so-called lucky packets that have not been impacted by so much, uh, so much queuing. And uh, when you uh, take care about those uh, facts and um, carefully engineer your network, uh, then you can be fine also with non-PTP compliant uh, networks as well, as it was done also uh, in the beginning, a couple of years ago, where uh, there were not so much uh, switches available uh, to provide these, uh, this feature, uh, where it actually worked as well. But then you have to, have to take care. Okay, thank you. And second question, um, how do you know the time is right when it comes out at the other end? Um, the time? Um, is, is synchronized to the internal GPS receiver. And the information, if this receiver and the system is synchronized to a primary reference source, is transported also within the packet. And then if, if, uh, if, if the active master degrades its accuracy because the um, GPS antenna is lost or uh, there's a problem with the uh, internal clock module or something else, this is announced and another backup system could take over that role then. So the masters have to take care among themselves that there's at least one available that is fully functional. Thank you. So this is the, the bit about uh, timing and specifically PTP I find uh, the most interesting. Uh, Daniel was talking about uh, masters um, deciding amongst themselves who's going to be the grand master. Uh, I mean, in the, the old days of television, uh, when I started, we had SPGs with a, a relay which clunked between master and backup. And that's now disappearing uh, because what we're getting is these grandmasters. And as I understand, uh, within the packet uh, data of the, the grandmaster uh, announced, there is a series of parameters which say how accurate that clock is. Correct. So all the devices listening to it can then decide which grandmaster is the grandmaster and which one they want to listen to. And then the grandmasters amongst themselves can decide who is the most accurate. 
So it brings up all kinds of interesting challenges because if somebody misconfigures a system and you have two grandmasters which have equal high priority parameters, they could end up fighting each other. Is that correct? They there, there, there is always a tiebreaker. And yeah. if, um, if uh, all masters announce the same quality parameters, then the last decision that is made is based on the MAC address of the system. Right. So there can only be one. So there can only ever be one. Yeah. And, and how do we monitor? Who, which clock is the grandmaster, how do we know? Because you know, th this is a network, it's not like sort of SDI or PAL where you can get a scope yeah. out and look at the signal. It, it's just messages, isn't it? Computer messages between yes, you, devices. So, so how do we monitor this? There are two things. You can monitor the traffic to see the relationships between the master and the slaves. Is there any connection at all? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is checking the accuracy. There are also two ways to do it, either requesting the device, uh, tell me how you think you accurate you, you are. Mm -hmm. Are you synchronized? Are you locked or not? What is your offset? And the other thing is an, an active measurement of the system. Um, Mimec did a proposal for that. We hope that it's going to be in one of the next stand, revisions of the standard to do some kind of reverse PTP uh, measurement mm -hmm. and monitor all these endnotes. But this is still some, uh, some way to go. So uh, there are options, um, um, for example, to put some probes at several points in the network to at least see, OK, at that boundary clock, the time seems to be drifting. So I can or I might uh, um, consider that all the other slaves that are connected to this boundary clock might drift as well. So uh, I, can, I can make some test probes in, in, in my network and monitor them uh, as an alternative. But uh, um, the best way, of course, would be to monitor the end nodes directly. Okay. Do we have any more questions? This one here first, and then. Hi, just going back to your German example, and why was it better to um, connect the, the two studios together over the WAN rather than just put a second GPS antenna up at the, at the remote studio? because it was either not possible or too expensive. Putting a GPS antenna on a roof, for example, at a, at a building where you just rent some space is very expensive in terms of also the month, monthly rates that you have to pay. So uh, sometimes it's not possible to do so. Um, sometimes you are forced to do so, but if you can avoid it, this can be a big advantage. Okay. Thank you. There's another question. Hi there. Uh, we've got a particular implementation where uh, I think we've come across all of the gotchas, um, particularly when it comes to provisioning uh, PTP flows through our SDN or our, our flow controller. Um, but one of the more, well, with hindsight, one of the more obvious uh, gotchas was insertion of PTP in different topologies. We use a traditional spine and leaf architecture, and our, our implementation uh, is, it, is it's necessary for PTP to be inserted into the spine. The spine runs at 100 gig, um, so we've we've had to, <laughs> we've had to uh, use or design um, yeah. PTP distributions. Which I'm just wondering if anyone anyone else has come across those type of architectural uh, issues where you've got very chatty small traffic PTP. You know, we're quite comfortable with chucking around 1.5 gig, 3 gig flows, yeah. but you've got very chatty PTP, very albeit very low bandwidth. Uh, how you get that into your network uh, efficiently? Um, usually, uh, a PTP Grandmaster just has a one gig port. Yeah. Um, and therefore, um, the, the way to go would be to uh, connect it to one of the leaf switches. But I've also seen already uh, where a one gig master is, um, was connected to, um, to, to a spine switch with an interesting chain of adapters. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the Swiss television did that somehow. I, I don't know uh, how, how they did it, but uh, it, it worked well, so that they direct, could directly connect uh, a one gig master to a spine switch. So there are options, actually. Um, and of course, uh, developments are ongoing, and al also there will be a PTP grandmaster available, at least with a 10 gig port. Um, uh, so that the, uh, this should also overcome these kind of problems. But as, as of today, uh, you need to find a way to attach a one gig, one gig port somehow. Okay, do we have one more question? Pass 
se pode ouvir. Uh, is there any sort of lookup tables to evaluate masters or boundary clocks in the messages per second rating for a particular profile and topology? You mean that you can look up uh, which rates are allowed, or what, what do you mean? Uh, for the number of devices in a particular topology type for that um, particular switch or, or master? Yeah, this, is, this is implementation specific, and uh, of course you, you need to ask your vendor for that. So this is out of the scope of a standard or, um, yeah. This but the, is the defined SMPTE profiles will sort of have default values for the number of messages for a particular are, slave. Yeah, there are default uh, messages. Uh, messages rates, for example, uh, eight sync messages per second is the default for, uh, for the SEMTI profile. But um, you are free to change that in your certain environment uh, when you see that uh, you, you end up with capacity problems, maybe, and then you can lower the rate down and see if it's still working. It's, it's a question if those end nodes are capable of, um, uh, of dealing with lower message rates as accurate as they would with higher message rates. So uh, this, this is a range that is allowed, and you're can, you can, uh, you can, you free to change that uh, according to your speci specific needs. Okay, thank you. I think it's just one last question over here. Uh, is it mm -hmm. fair to say, Daniel, that um, we also have to be concerned with the number of devices connected to a clock? Because we have too many devices and there are too many message requests, and that can also impact um, time and accuracy. No, the, the accuracy should not be uh, an issue here. Uh, it's just um, where a point where, where the packets seem to uh, start to drop. Okay. And um, you only have this problem in networks where you use transparent clocks or no PTP-aware switches. And if you have the default settings of the SEMTI profile and you can imagine that you have, for example, 500 or 1,000 devices in your network uh, using the um, using the SEMTI default settings, then you end up with approximately 15,000, 20,000 uh, PTP packets per second that a master should handle. Okay. I know one who can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. But this is, this is something that you need to, um, need to be aware of when you, when you select uh, uh, vendors or when you, uh, when you select parameters to configure. Okay. So one more question. You mentioned Dante's uh, PTP V1. Yes. So how do you synchronize Dante into a PTP V2 environment? Um, there are gateways available, um, also provided by the, by, the, by the Dante community. But you can also use, for example, a PTP version 1 master module. You can use it also in, in, uh, in, uh, in our system here. You, you, that you have, for example, one PTP version 2 uh, card for the SEMTI and for the Ravenna world, and an additional PTP version 1 master card that is synchronizing a Dante island. Uh, or you add a boundary clock in between that is capable of receiving PTP version 2 as an input and PTP version 1 as an output. And then you can, can connect uh, those two worlds. So it's, it's possible to integrate. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel from Meinberg. If you'd show your appreciation, please. Thank you.